Welcome everyone. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to remind you of a few ways that the Georgia Center for Nonprofits is supporting you and your work right now. Many of you may be considering reopening or resuming some type of in-person operations, and so we are gathering guidance for you on our COVID-19 resource page. The URL is there on the screen. You can find those links in the operations document on our resource hub. Uh, and GCN members, you also have access to a free one-hour rapid response session with our consulting team, which you can access via the link you see there. I also want to mention our scenario planning guides, which are helpful tools as we face unknown factors in the weeks and months ahead. Um, you know, we possibly could be looking at, or we're certainly looking at a recession and, and possibly a reemergence of the virus in the fall that could come with additional shelter in place or work from home type orders. So now is a good time to evaluate what you've done, plan for, for those factors, um, and have, have a plan in your pocket so that you are ready to execute those if any of those scenarios actually play out. Uh, those, those full scenario planning guides and webinars that we've already done are available on the replay page, the webinar replay page, which you can find at COVID-19, uh, and they're labeled as scenario planning. So those should be pretty accessible to you there. Finally, Nonprofit University, which is our professional development platform, is offering 30% off classes in May. So we encourage you to visit that site and look at those and see if there's something coming up that may be able to help you or your team, um, especially if you are, are keeping people on payroll because maybe you got a PPP loan, uh, but uh, they aren't able to do uh, in-person or client activities this is a great time to pivot toward professional development and uh, make sure that they are ready to go for uh, whatever is next. Okay, it looks like we probably have a few folks that are still going to join us, but we will go ahead and, and get started. So what are we gonna cover today? Well, let's start with some introductions. My name is Emily Gantert, and I am the Event and Association Coordinator with the Georgia Center for Nonprofits. In addition to working with our internal team at GCN on programs and events, uh, I work with local and nonprofit, non, uh, I'm sorry, local and national nonprofit associations, providing them operational and administrative support. That means working with employees and volunteers, both locally and remotely. Um, and so many of the tools we'll discuss here today, I use, uh, I use with those clients. And now let me turn it over to Matthew. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew George, and I support curriculum and faculty relationships with Nonprofit University. Nonprofit University, as most of you are aware, is our professional development and training program at the Georgia Center for Nonprofits. We offer a variety of courses, um, all of which have uh, transitioned to a virtual platform over these last months and will continue to do so into the summer, so I encourage you to visit us uh, online at nonprofituniversity.org or gcn.org slash events to see the updated calendar. Excellent. And so what we're going to cover today are tools to help you collaborate and communicate with your teams and clients, um, and hopefully without busting your likely already busted budget. So uh, especially as we've moved to remote work, we're unsure of how long this is going to go on, if it's going to reemerge. We've considered uh, that nonprofit budgets, uh, especially in light of the impending recession, are taking a hit. And so we've tried to pull together some, some guidance here uh, to help you navigate ways to work together and collaborate. Uh, you can submit questions as we go in the chat. Hopefully you saw that pop up at the beginning. It's going to be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So go ahead and take a second and locate that chat. Um, we will take questions there as we go. If we see it while we're, while we're on a topic, we'll try to adjust, address it at the time. Otherwise, we will also uh, do some Q&A at the end of the presentation. I do want to issue a small disclaimer. We are not paid by any of these companies. Um, this is purely intended as an overview based on Matthew and I's experience uh, using these tools and working in the nonprofit world. Um, and is not a formal endorsement of any kind. So before we get into the actual tools, let's take a look at things to consider as we, as we work through today's presentation. 
and certainly before you decide to implement anything new for your own organization. So what are you already using? You may already have an investment in certain products, whether that's licensing fees or training that you've, you've given your staff or your volunteers. Uh, certainly consider that before moving into something new. How will this work with other software and programs? You're going to hear integration a lot as we talk through these things. Certain programs are specifically designed to work with others. For example, uh, we are on a Zoom call right now, and Zoom has an integration where you can um, automatically have your Zoom meetings synced to your Microsoft Outlook calendar. So that's an integration between those two companies that are owned by separate entities. When you uh, it's that kind of integration that's something to just keep in mind here. What hardware will we need for these tools to be successful? So uh, it may be that in your physical location, you have a certain set of equipment and that is managed um, by an IT person or managed by, by you, even as, as a CEO or an administrator there. Um, people are home, they're working from home, they may be using their own equipment, you may have had to pinch it and, and secure equipment for those employees and volunteers. Um, be mindful of those things. Are they on laptops, desktops, tablets, phones? I know uh, at GCN, we are all working on all of those things um, pretty much daily. Uh, so we have lots of things going at once. Are they using a Microsoft product, an Apple product, or a Chrome product? So that would look like a PC, a Mac, or a Chromebook. Um, those operating systems make a difference uh, with using some of these apps. And then the actual, even if you're all within Microsoft, if everyone's using PCs, uh, you may have different operating systems, XP, Windows 8, Windows 10. They do function a little bit differently with some of these uh, applications. So that's something to be aware of. Additionally, certain tools, certain applications may have minimum operating system requirements, so they may not be compatible with XP. And this is a really important one. What are your teams already using, even if it's unofficially? So we went through this exercise at GCN about, uh, about six weeks ago um, where we surveyed employees on their use of different tools and applications, if that was all in the platform that GCN provided, or if people were working on third-party tools uh, just on their own because they were comfortable with them or they had experience with them um, or they offered something that um, what we were using in-house didn't provide. And what we found, for example, was that uh, our marketing team was using Asana um, and that was really important to them and to their operations. That wasn't something that we could, we could sort of move them away from reasonably. So be aware of that, what they're using. Comfort level using technology, whether that is hardware, physical devices, a lot of people are still used to a desktop computer, um, or software, so um, using some of these new tools or using them in a new way, which we'll talk about. Um, be prepared to have at least one person become the in-house expert. Um, I think that's really important because there are online tutorials and we're going to send you those and certainly the applications themselves have user guides but there is nothing to replace having someone actually with you and being able to ask q a so be prepared to have someone become your in-house expert on these um, and and that one-to-one -one training is a sometimes the best learning method for some and be willing and prepared to spend time with them um, if that's video chat we had a lot of people when this first happened uh, when we first experienced COVID that had never used video chat before, right? And so now we're all using it all the time. Um, there were certainly some humps to get over to get people acclimated to that. So one-on-one -on -one time uh, to do that. Next thing to keep in mind as we walk through these, there are different versions of the same software. So what you're typically used to is a desk, or most people at least, how I grew up was using desktop applications. So those are going to be, you downloaded software onto your device and then you click on an icon to open it and you can see it in your taskbar that's usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
that's very traditional way of doing things. An example of that would be Microsoft Word, any of really the Microsoft uh, products, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. When we did that survey at GCN, what we found was that some people were only using their desktop, but some people were also using what we call a browser app. This is where you go to a URL or a website, and it opens the application in a browser tab, and no additional software is downloaded onto your computer. So there may be version requirements with your browser in order to uh, have full function and security of that application in your browser. Um, so some people were using desktop only, some were using browser only, some were using both. But what we needed was for the whole team to be familiar with their desktop and their browser app because we were anticipating the challenges coming ahead with work from home. Um, and, and people not being able to take their desktop computer at the office home with them. So browser apps do have a little bit different functionality. But the basics should be the same. Um, there's a couple of important differences here. The first is browser apps run through the cloud, uh, which is over the internet, and not on your machine, where the desktop app runs off of your, your physical device. Typically, browser apps have an autosave feature because they're continuously syncing to the cloud when they are saved. So if you grew up the way I did and you learned on desktop apps, then the hard, hard rule they drilled into you was, Save every 30 minutes. Make your changes and save your document because if you don't, uh, if it crashes or something freezes, you are out of luck and you've lost the work from the last time you saved. And that made sense when we were saving to a physical location. But now that we're saving to the cloud, um, those browser apps are constantly um, saving as you go. So every keystroke, it's logging it and sending it back through the internet to the cloud where the document lives. Um, and so it's keeping track of that as you go. That's a wonderful feature. But it can hang people up uh, with save as versus save a copy. So save a copy is like, it's the browser version of save as, except you need to copy before you make changes. So in a traditional document, you're, uh, you open something up and you go, okay, this is a really good template of a letter. We want to keep the original, but we want to make changes and have a second version of it as well. So you would make the changes and then go to save as. In the cloud, that does not work because it's logging every keystroke as a change as you make it in real time. So what you need to do is before you make changes to that first document, save a copy and then open that copy and make the changes. That way you preserve your original document and your secondary document. So, we're not going to get into that detail with everything, but that is a pretty basic functionality that's significantly different between the two. So we do like to touch on that. Another important thing to keep in mind, if you're using a browser app because it uses the cloud and is over the internet, being disconnected from the internet can sometimes cause some functionality issues or give you trouble saving. So just keep that in mind. One more factor here are mobile apps. So these tools may have a desktop application, a browser application, uh, or a mobile application. Um, mobile apps are a little different. They're kind of in between the two because they do need an internet connection for functionality, um, internet or, um, or like your phone, your phone data. But you also do have to download software, an app, onto your phone or tablet to use it. So those are the three ways that these tools um, may be presented. So we're going we're gonna to bucket our tools into five categories. The first is document management. Document management is where you're creating, storing, or sharing files. So that could be um, in Microsoft, that would be uh, OneDrive or SharePoint. In Google, that would be your Google Drive. We're going to cover document management. We're going to cover internal communication. So not email, um, I think everyone's pretty familiar with email, right? But internal communication, these are also uh, sort of colloquially called chat, um, but it is an internal communication tool. Um, these are for, you know, quick questions, collaborations, um, what would in an office be water cooler chat or, or kitchen talk, 
Um, and then also they're great for morale and team boosting, shooting little notes to your team to say, hey, good work on this, or to celebrate a group of people within your organization who may be uh, on that internal tool. We also do, uh, are gonna cover time management. So this has two different, two different buckets. One is tracking. You may have, uh, for a client, need to track specific hours on specific projects. That could also be because of grant requirements. Uh, you want to specifically know how much time an employee is spending on a certain project. You could also use tracking, uh, time managed tracking tools to um, keep tabs on your employees if you feel like that's, that's an important thing that you need either maybe to report to your board or just for internal metrics to keep track of their time if they're working from home. Uh, so there are gonna be some tools for that. We also have a bucket of scheduling. So these are gonna be tools that, uh, calendars, right? Calendaring and scheduling meetings and coordinating schedules across your team, both internally and externally as well. We're also gonna cover project management tools. These are uh, who will do it and what's the time frame for getting it done. And then finally, virtual meetings, everyone's favorite. This is sort of the most, most people are gonna be familiar with these virtual meeting tools, um, but it's also a pretty competitive market. So whether you're looking at doing larger scale events and webinars with dozens or even hundreds of people on them, there are platforms that do that. But then you also may need virtual meetings right now for one-to-one -one client meetings or internal team meetings. Um, most of the virtual meeting platforms also offer a screen sharing function, which is great if you don't necessarily want to be on video, uh, but you need something a little more than a call in order to collaborate and work on something together. And of course, there are all-in-one suites that do or offer tools for all or most of, of these applications. And that's what we're gonna start with. So uh, for an overview, we have Office, most people are familiar with Office 365 and Google Suite. Um, Office 365 and Google actually both offer a free version and a licensed version of their software. So for Office 365, um, you can get a free Microsoft email account. I believe it's called, it, at one point at least it's called Live. It's been, it was formerly Hotmail. Um, those are free email accounts. Anyone can sign up for it. But Microsoft doesn't really provide you free access to anything else in their suite of products with that email account. But if you pay for a license, um, that's gonna cover most of their applications. Some of them are upgraded, but especially the basic ones, Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Publisher, OneNote, uh, Teams, we could go on and on. Uh, the, your Office 365 licenses are gonna cover that for you and also for your team. Another advantage to licenses is they provide administrative control over all of the user licenses. So I think that's a really important function for sustainability within your organization to have, uh, to have that admin control over the software and email and things like that. Google, on the other hand, offers free accounts, and in addition to an email address, you also get some basic uh, Google applications, so chat, storage through Google Drive, uh, documents, Word, Excel, things like that, calendaring, um, and, and chat. So those are available for free with Google. You get a little more on the free account. But with G Suite, which is their licensing, um, you get admin controls, with both Office 365 and G Suite licensing, you can use a custom domain for your email. So instead of it being uh, emily at gmail.com, it could be emily at gcn.org. Um, so that's an extra feature. And then G Suite for nonprofits is free. So why not? Uh, if, if that's what you're using, go ahead and um, formalize that for your organization. There is some paperwork you have to submit um, to, to qualify. Um, and they, they do have access to almost the full suite. Uh, you can upgrade your storage and add on some additional Google, um, Google apps for slightly additional costs. So right now, the majority of Office 365 and the majority of G Suite are available in browser, desktop, and or mobile applications. Um, most of them work as, as desktop and, and browser pretty seamlessly. Some of them also have mobile apps. 
again, just uh, if you are going to go one of these routes, uh, be aware of, of some functionality difference there for your users. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew to walk us through the different, the different tools here. Thank you, Emily. We're going to start with document management and storing files. Uh, as you can see on the screen, you know, cloud, uh, cloud file storage facilitates collaboration. People can do all sorts of things with a file, including editing it, as well as making comments on it, or just looking it over in real time without having to pass an attachment back and forth by email. So it's an exponentially more efficient way of working together on documents. Also, the uh, important thing for these systems is files are available anywhere. As long as you're connected to the internet and are syncing, whether it's on your computer or on your mobile device, you have the latest file and you can see exactly where things are again in real time. When looking at those all-in-one systems, Microsoft's version is, uh, goes by a couple of names. There's OneDrive and then there's SharePoint. And the easiest way to think about the differences between those two is that OneDrive is your personal files, kind of your My Documents, if you're familiar with the Windows system. Whereas SharePoint is more your share drive, server drive, the public drive, whatever you might call it at your organization. But that place where on maybe your local intranet or network, all of the files are shared and anyone has access to them. Now within OneDrive, you can share files with other people and uh, you can do that by link sharing, which you can send by uh, email. And it's all integrated. If you're already living within the Microsoft universe, you can uh, send an email from OneDrive and it automatically goes through your, your Outlook account to somebody else. Um, and then SharePoint, people collaboratively already have access when you're setting up the, the teams around it. Google Drive works in a similar way, although it's a little more straightforward. It's just one access point and one name for where the files are. And you can establish folders, again, that belong to you as a single user or that belong to a team or even the entire organization. And again, you can set it up like your, um, your intranet, your public drive, your server drive, um, if, uh, if that's the way you, you would like to go. Um, there are two other uh, main providers within uh, the storing files, uh, the cloud storage universe. And uh, those two that we want to mention are Dropbox and Box. Most of you are probably familiar with Dropbox. Um, Box, maybe you've, uh, you've heard of or you thought, well, the, maybe they just meant Dropbox. Uh, but there is a separate um, option called boxbox.com. Um, both of these have varying degrees of integration with um, Microsoft and Google systems. And in some cases, you may have some unofficial adopting of Dropbox or Box by members of your team or by teams because they need some sort of a cloud storage quick workaround to be able to share files either from the office with their personal devices or with other people outside the organization. Um, something to note about Dropbox and why, and Box, and why people may have gone to that route. Uh, with a free individual account, you get five gigabytes with Dropbox and 10 gigabytes with Box. So they are uh, free to pilot um, if you want to give them a shot, and you get a decent amount of storage space with each of those if you want to try them out for your organization. Again, many teams may have unofficially adopted one or both of these platforms over time. Um, whether um, to formally expand their internal usage and try to migrate people over to them is, um, uh, 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 um, is something that you need to consider. If, you're already, uh, if you already have a Microsoft Office subscription, for example, um, you may want to consider trying to migrate people off of Dropbox or Box and use OneDrive or SharePoint, which would give you more administrative controls, but that's entirely up to you. Dropbox at this point has multiple integrations with Microsoft Word and other apps, making the issue of disconnection between your various platforms, between Outlook and OneDrive and Dropbox, a little less, um, less of an issue. So the next feature we'd like to go into is chat. And starting again out with those two primary systems, Microsoft and Google, Microsoft's chat function primarily comes through Teams uh, right now. Um, it, there's a chat feature within it, and you can uh, also comment on various documents 
um, by uh, tagging people um, and referring to various topics uh, when you are making comments on documents in, say, a PowerPoint presentation or a Word document. And that can all be integrated into Teams, and you can see all those comments in one place. Microsoft also has a, another app um, that's a program they acquired, they bought a few years ago called Yammer, which is a devoted chat function. Um, multiple organizations that we work with use it to varying degrees of success. Many of them are using it because they feel like it's an inborn chat function, chat feature, chat app that they can use. Um, but they've found a varying degrees of success in using it. And overall, it appears that Microsoft is trying to put more of their attention into the integrated chat feature within Teams. Google, if you're in that ecosystem or interested in exploring it, has a couple of different chat options, Hangouts and Chat, straightforward name. You can chat via text or uh, there is video options available in there. Uh, Google products are a bit confusing um, because they have uh, different names and really different products, depending on whether you're using them with a personal account, so at gmail.com, or a business account, again, being able to use your own domain. However, the important thing to understand is that they are basic chat apps, both of them, similar to iMessage, WhatsApp, and other chat and instant messaging programs that you might be familiar with. The leading independent chat app, chat platform, is Slack. If you haven't used Slack, you may at least have heard of it or been familiar with it. Slack is even turning into a verb in the same way that Google is for searching. Um, Slack is entirely devoted to chat. And there's two main ways that you can be chatting people or chatting with people. One is individual conversations. You, I send a message to you, you send a message back, we have a conversation. It looks and acts like a, an, an individual one-on-one -on -one text conversation you might have with someone. There's also ways that you can chat with groups of people. And um, in, in those, you set up channels. Basically, a channel is a group text. And you can organize those by the people who were involved. I only want to chat with Mary and Rakim. And so the three of us have a conversation. Or they're organized by topic. And that topic could be something related to your business domain, or it could be something that's more of that social water cooler chat that Emily mentioned earlier. And that's something where people are able to join and remove themselves from the conversation anytime they'd like. At GCN, some of our channels are nonprofit university, where anyone can follow the conversation on updates to our registration numbers, new classes, and so on. We also have a channel called Ideas, where people post suggestions for our annual Ideas newsletter on innovations in the sector in Georgia. We also, though, have channels like Music, for music recommendations and sharing, and Random, which is where we put our jokes, our gifs, our silliness, and just personal life updates that people want to share with the team. We had Slack in place before we expanded our use of Microsoft's 365 system, including Teams, which has many of the similar functions as Slack. We have kept Slack over Teams because we built it out in a way that we like already, and its multiple integrations with Outlook, OneDrive, and other Microsoft apps minimizes any disconnect between using a non-Microsoft app alongside the Microsoft suite. For time management and thinking about scheduling, within Microsoft, you're basically talking about Outlook, and Google, you're talking about Calendar. We're, we're looking at the Calendar functions within those two platforms. Both of them, uh, as you probably know, allow the sharing as well as sending of links that let people see when you're free. So uh, depending on the platform and the platform of the person you're sharing it with, they have varying degrees of uh, viewing rights or even editing rights on your calendar. And in both of that, both platforms offer varying degrees of allowing you to share um, appointment slots and allow people to sign up for those in an automated way that doesn't require you trading emails back and forth. However, um, their functionality is limited, and we'd like to look at a couple of options that are more intentional for sharing your availability and scheduling. Um, Doodle is probably the most well-known. It's great for scheduling group meetings, but can also be done one-on-one. -on -one. 
Calendly is a more recent addition, but one that has been helpful to us at GCN as we've been scheduling our rapid response consulting appointments with organizations around the state. Calendly is more for people to be able to find your availability and grab time. It also has more bells and whistles with a free account than Doodle does, and especially more with a paid account. Calendly is also Atlanta-based and Black-owned, helping it stand apart in the tech world. Both are primarily based in browsers with some mobile. Both have a limited function in their free personal version. They can import Google and Outlook calendars and integrate in real time, depending on your level of license and setting. Time tracking is a bit of a gap for the all-in-one products when thinking about Microsoft or Google. There are add-ons available for Microsoft Office 365, both free and paid, and third-party integrations for the G Suite. Um, typically, they integrate with Excel or the Sheets uh, product, um, producing some sort of a spreadsheet or workbook that describes the, uh, that, that shows all of the time tracking. Let's look at a couple of leading independent apps for time tracking, though. The two leading platforms are Harvest, there on the left, and Toggle on the right. Harvest has integrations with other systems, including databases like Mavenlink and Salesforce, and is better for teams reporting and analyzing work time. Toggle has similar functions and is also used by many freelancers for tracking their own time without needing to feed into a larger report or a larger team report. The Toggle mobile app is basically a button you tap on the timer on your screen to start the timer on a project or a stream of work, and then you tap it again to stop the clock and record the session, which feeds into a spreadsheet. There's also an integration for um, both Mac OS and Windows, um, where you can have a similar function in your taskbar, your task manager, where you click a button to stop, start the timer, click a button to stop the timer, and it automatically feeds that into the database or spreadsheet, however you have it set up. More than simply tracking the team's time spent on something, we believe that understanding what people are doing, the outcomes of the work, is more vital to the ongoing success of your organization meeting its mission, regardless of the environment, in-person or virtual. And with that in mind, let's spend some time on task and project management tools. Microsoft has a couple of options. To do is a basic checklist similar to Google Tasks, which is shown on the right side of your screen. If you use an iPhone, the built-in Apple's Reminders app works in a similar way. Um, people can share and assign tasks through Microsoft To Do and Google Tasks, but the functionality is ultimately limited to a few basic features. Planner there on the left is Microsoft's larger attempt at collaborative task and project management. Each project or stream of work gets a board, which is basically a screen with columns, each column representing a bucket of work or a step or phase in some sort of a linear path of a project. Each task is put on a rectangle, which is often called a card, which when clicked contains information like the due date, person assigned, description, checklists, and so on. Each card automatically records the history of actions taken on that card, meaning that task. So you have a running record of what has happened, similar, similar to how Emily described the running record and the automatic updates you get when collaborating on documents and other files in real time in your cloud storage platforms. This sort of board approach, sometimes called Kanban, K-A-N-B-A-N, rooted in Toyota's manufacturing methods in the 80s, can be used for individual work tracking, collaborative team projects. Both of those platforms um, are, ideal, are ideal for browser and mobile, although um, you will find some ability to have a desktop version. These two options on your screen now are key independent players, Trello and Asana, both of which are um, uh, kind of far and away for business uses, the leading uh, task and project management um, uh, platforms that we're seeing organizations use. Trello works in the board or Kanban approach that I mentioned earlier with Planner, and in fact has been a leading app in this approach for a few years now. Asana there on the right offers a couple of options. You can have a traditional checklist and also the board view. 
You pick one of those formats when creating a new project and you go from there. The task list is more robust than the simpler lists that Microsoft To Do and Google Tasks offers. Nonprofit University uses Asana to track our class development from idea and planning phases through content development and class delivery. We use the board view to move cards for each class from left to right across each phase of our class prep, reassigning the card, which represents a class, as needed across each step of the phase to make sure nothing gets lost. Both Trello and Asana have integrations with other platforms we have mentioned today. For example, many of us at GCN have the Asana plugin for Outlook, which allows us to turn an email into a task, including the due date and a reminder alert date, and the body of the email will appear in the description or the comments of the task when viewed in Asana. So when I use that, I have all the context I need in a to-do in an assigned task there in Asana, and I don't have to keep that email just sitting in my inbox. For more robust project management, when thinking about collaboration, Basecamp and Monday are two platforms that go beyond just kind of to-dos and integrate more intentional chat and file sharing. It's, they're real collaboration spaces. They're optimized for browser and mobile, much like Trello and Asana are. If you want to take advantage of the power of the cloud to keep everyone connected and aware of what everyone else is doing, these platforms are worth a look. If you're already using Microsoft Office 365, however, you may want to give Teams another look. And now Emily will walk us through Teams as well as then virtual meeting and webinar apps. Excellent. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, let's see, let my computer catch up here. Microsoft Teams. Uh, it's going to be really helpful to think of, te of Teams not as an application that performs a function, but as a framework that interfaces with several Microsoft apps plus some third-party applications. Um, it's almost like a virtual uh, war room. So if you were tackling a project, you may have gathered your whole team in a conference room and pinned up newspaper to the wall or, or busted out the whiteboard and done some brainstorming and then divided into groups and, uh, and, uh, and done some work there and then come back together and worked on a conclusion. Um, this is sort of a virtual way to do that using Microsoft's uh, other applications uh, to, to connect, to make those processes happen. So Microsoft Teams uh, interfaces with chat, which Matthew has, has described to us, and uh, their chat also then includes these channels, which is where you can kind of organize your discussion and train of thought and, um, and minimize people uh, that need to be on that task. So sometimes we get trapped uh, on, on emails with a group of people and then one person says, oh, and can I get an update on, and it's something that doesn't have anything to do with you know, that email or all of the people on that email, um, but they all then get caught in the replies. The channels uh, and, and chat in Teams helps you to kind of focus um, those discussions. It also interfaces with document storage. So not only their own, which is SharePoint and OneDrive, but also Dropbox, Box, and Google Drive. Um, that really helps to facilitate sharing of documents. Um, if you're like Matthew and I did, if you're collaborating on a PowerPoint, um, then you can both see it in the same place at the same time, which is really helpful. We also, it, it has a, um, an area for notifications. So in addition to, you know, someone's posted something in this channel, uh, it's gonna show you uh, updates to your documents. So that can be really helpful. I know we use it for the webinars, or we will be able to use it for the webinars. We've just uh, launched this internally as well. But um, when our VP Kathy Keeley is working on a presentation, it will it can keep a log that, hey, Kathy just updated this document. And instead of me having to, in a physical world, walk down the hall and ask her if she's made those updates, or in a virtual world, call her, chat her, email her, and ask those questions, I can actually just go to my notifications window and see that Kathy opened the document and made the changes. So that's really efficient. It also interfaces with Planner, which Matthew just uh, talked about. 
So again, these are all tools that teams use, physical teams in your organization, uh, people teams use uh, within this Teams framework. Microsoft kind of helps them all to work together, uh, these applications to work together and provides a framework for that. And with that, it also includes uh, their video chat. Um, as far as I know, Microsoft doesn't have a standalone video chat. Um, they have Skype, and we'll get into that in a moment, but um, Teams is really where um, they have this, this excellent video uh, meeting tool, and you can use that with internal uh, recipients in your organization or internal and external, so between an employee and a client or a volunteer. It's almost like a virtual, uh, a virtual war room, if you will. Two other great features about Microsoft Teams that I, I personally have found really helpful as I've, as I've worked in Teams. You can take uh, meeting notes in real time. So when you set up a meeting, that's going to interface with your Outlook calendar in Teams. Um, you can uh, share a document that you're working on that's relevant to the team, but also as you're on, uh, on a call, on a meeting, um, you can take meeting notes and it will associate those notes to that meeting for everyone on the team. So that is really excellent. And they also, as some of the other, um, other apps do, they have a whiteboard function. So uh, if you want to do some brainstorming, multiple people can um, sort of scribble on the whiteboard uh, at the same time. That obviously is a little bit better on a mobile application than it is on your browser or your uh, desktop where you are um, having to use a mouse to write versus using your finger if you're on a tablet or a touchscreen device. And calls. So Microsoft Teams does have a call function. Being perfectly honest, I have not cracked how to make external calls in Microsoft Teams. It's possible that that's an administrator function. So earlier on, we talked about how you need to have one person in your organization that really owns how to use these um, the applications you're going to use, um, there are settings then when you do an all-in-one or you purchase a team license and control the users, there are certain functions. It's, it's great for security, but some of them drill down to very specific functions. And so pay attention to what those are and make sure that they are set up for your team to use uh, how they are intending to use it. So if you want them to make external calls, you need to make sure that there's um, an external calling feature enabled as an admin so that the users can execute that on their end. I'm going to pivot just slightly for a moment since we're talking about calling and talk about Google Voice. So Google Voice is um, Google's answer to uh, a phone system. Um, Microsoft doesn't have anything like this. Um, I actually, there, I'm sure there are some third-party apps, but if you're already using G Suite, or have a free Google account, uh, Microsoft, I'm sorry, Google Voice is available to you. And the reason I'm bringing it up in this presentation is if you don't have access to your physical office phones, but employees need to be able to get calls or volunteers get calls and they don't wanna give out their personal cell phone for lots of reasons, um, Google Voice is a great alternative. It's a free platform and it gives you an actual phone number and you can, you can even customize it to be a local area code. So Georgia has 678-770 and 404 numbers uh, available through Google Voice. Um, and it has, a, it has a browser app. It also has a mobile app and it gives you some extra functions like being able to put on a do not disturb so people uh, when they clock out at the end of the day are not continuing to get work calls, especially from perhaps clients or volunteers. Um, so as we navigate work from home, that can be a really helpful uh, tool that you give to your employees. Okay, we're gonna talk about virtual meetings and event platforms next. This is where things get a little crazy in the market. Uh, we've got Microsoft. So Teams we already talked about that interfaces with um, your Outlook calendar, you can include non-team member users. So you can, you can do uh, video chats with people not in your, in your organization, which is great. And it is a browser app. So there's no additional software for people who want to join that. Um, and there are no downloads. They do have to have a certain version of their browser, which is pretty common across these. Skype is the other one that they, they own. Microsoft bought Skype several years ago now. Um, 
it is sort of the OG version of video conferencing. Uh, it's certainly international. Um, and so Skype is part of their, their suite as well. That is something that is free to all Microsoft users, whether you have a license or not. If you have a Hotmail or a Live or a license account, you can, uh, you can access Skype. Google, on the other hand, has Hangouts. I saw someone ask about uh, Meet. They're essentially the same product, but uh, Meet was the business version. And then after COVID hit, they made that free. Um, it probably has a few extra uh, bells and whistles in it. Um, so it's sort of a, a, a juiced up version of Microsoft, or I'm sorry, Google Hangouts. Hangouts is free with a user account. Um, it's not ideal for larger meetings. You can have multiple people on a Google Hangout. I would really equate it more to FaceTime, uh, where you can have a couple of people and, and, and touch base with them throughout the day. It really comes in also as a call. It doesn't have to be scheduled versus in Microsoft Teams um, and, and even Zoom, which we're coming up on. Uh, those are traditionally used uh, when you've scheduled something. So that, that's an important difference. And then Duo, Google also owns Duo. This really started as an Android application for them. So when they started getting into the phone world, Duo was their answer to FaceTime. Uh, but now you can also access Duo via browser. And so they've, that's got video. I don't believe Duo has a chat function. I believe it's just video, um, but I'm absolutely willing to be wrong about that. Primarily, these are browser and mobile. That's just by nature of, of um, having, a, having a video attached to that. Um, and a more robust desktop setup with Microsoft, that will almost always be the case because that is how Microsoft originated was through desktop apps. So they're more likely to have downloadable software than a lot of these others. So then in the, in the third party category, we have primarily Zoom and GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar. Zoom, obviously super popular right now. I think that actually really works in its favor, especially if you are, um, you are trying to connect with people who you're not sure what their software is and you're not sure what their connectivity and what devices they're on. Zoom uh, works for everybody, and since everybody's using it, um, it's, it's pretty reliable that they're going to be able to access and navigate this platform. Obviously, GCN uses it. We're using it uh, right now for this very webinar. It's free up to 40 minutes per user, so that's for a free account. Anyone can sign up. They get 40 minutes uh, calls free. After that, it does cut them off. There are some specials that Zoom is offering right now if you are in education that um, allows you to get longer calls for free. So definitely investigate that if that is your nonprofit focus. Um, you can participate. Zoom just unveiled a few weeks ago after COVID started um, this browser only version. It is an admin function. So you have to first go into your account and enable people to join via browser. Um, and then it will be available to people when you send out the links or invite. There, uh, is no account needed then. They don't have to ha download any Zoom software and then they don't have to um, have an account. Please read up on how to use Zoom securely. We'll provide uh, an article in the replay links that touches on this, but because Zoom is so popular, it makes it a bigger target for spammers. And so um, I'm sure you've seen the stories. I won't, I won't retell them here, but of people getting what they call Zoom bombs. So that's people you don't want in your meeting jumping in because they were able to access uh, via an open Zoom link um, and cause chaos on your calls. We don't want that. <laughs> so uh, read up on how to use Zoom securely, any of these products really, but especially with Zoom because it's such a big target. Zoom also integrates with Calendly, GCal, Outlook, I'm sure many more. Uh, they're really focused on making it very easy for you to use their product right now. That is their main goal. So they're, they're working on those integrations. On the other side, you have GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar. They do offer a free trial, um, but after that time expires, you do move into a paid account. GoToMeeting has, a, has some different participant controls. I don't know right now I want to say more because they're both changing so rapidly because of how much people are using them. But they do have, um, uh, for the, from the admin side, they have offer more controls over what people can and cannot do. And again, because it's not the most popular and the most used, um, they're not having as many security issues as some of, uh, as Zoom, as Zoom certainly is. 
So these are all available as desktop or phone applications uh, and on your browser as well. Both of these have licensing options, if I didn't mention this already, where you can purchase multiple licenses controlled by an admin. Again, we, we really recommend that for an organization. Um, and it, in the end, I think you're gonna get a better product at a better price if you do it as an organization, rather than having each of your, say, employees have a free 40-minute Zoom account. Uh, there may actually be a lot of benefit to go ahead and having a Zoom team account, um, including being able to have multiple people host, uh, host on a call, which is great if you are not sure if your internet's gonna go out, which is happening to all of us off and on, right? All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Matthew to talk to us about um, different tutorials that are available and maybe some discount in pricing as well. Thanks, Emily. Right now, many of these tools, in fact, all of these tools that we've described on the webinar today are incredibly popular and are being used by individuals and businesses uh, across the world. Because of that, there are many more resources available on all of these tools and how to use them, both from the, uh, the makers and creators of the tools themselves, as well as from other people, interested users, um, making their own tutorials. Um, these can be articles, these are videos, these are podcasts, whatever your learning platform or, or medium of choice, there are tutorials out there available for you. For Microsoft Office and Google Suite, there's two places in particular we'd like to point you to. The Collaboration Coach um, is a, uh, has a channel on YouTube with um, a number of well-produced, simple explainers on the various aspects of Microsoft Office 365, including Teams, including OneDrive and SharePoint. It explains how all of these things work, why they're set up the way they are, and how to integrate them and, and, and make them function within your team. So go to YouTube, search Collaboration Coach, and you'll find the channel with all of the various uh, playlists and individual videos. If you're interested more in uh, learning about Google's platform and G Suite, um, you can go to the URL there on the screen or uh, just search um, in YouTube or your preferred video platform about G Suite, Google Apps, and you'll find information uh, that you're looking for. For all of the other platforms we've mentioned, they all have FAQ documents, videos, um, and, and various other ways to walk you through how their platforms work. They all understand how important their platforms are to people staying in touch and businesses continuing to function right now. So they're interested in getting out information on what their platforms do and how they work and making that information as easy to understand and put into place and practice as possible. So if you go to the sources, they will also be able to direct you immediately to useful videos and useful articles for information. Um, as Emily mentioned earlier, an important thing to, to keep in mind is uh, communication internally. So these are collaboration tools. That's why you're all on the webinar today and interested in these collaboration tools. Make sure you're communicating any useful resources that you find with other members of your team. Don't assume everyone else understands it and you're the only one who doesn't. Um, there are plenty of people out there who are trying to figure out how all of these things work. And so your whole team is going to find a solution that works best for you by staying in touch. So make sure if you find any of these tools useful, share them with other members of your team. Strong training is important. And as Emily has mentioned over and over again, and I'll repeat, it's great to have someone internally who can be an expert on the tool. In addition, we'd like to point out TechSoup. Some of you may be familiar with TechSoup.org. And they are a provider of free and low cost um, hardware and software for nonprofit organizations. We've got a few uh, screenshots here up on the, the screen now of their website. You can see they're highlighting their resources for nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. That's trying to push out a lot of the products, kind of like what we've talked about today, these collaboration products, these communication products to help your team be able to keep its operations moving as smoothly as possible under the conditions. And there on the right side of the screen, you can see some of the offerings that TechSoup has. 
uh, if you are looking for access to any of the Adobe products, if you're looking for low-cost upgrades to the latest versions of Windows or QuickBooks or security platforms like Norton. They also offer a variety of services, help desk, manage IT, and so on. Um, and then they've also got, got hardware. If you're looking at networking, if you're looking at hotspots, if you're looking at printers or computers, both new and refurbished, this is not necessarily an endorsement of all of their services, and TechSoup has not asked us to promote them on today's webinar. We did want to point them out as a resource that many organizations have a history of going to to find certain products at competitive prices. Um, GCN has used TechSoup um, in the past, so we can speak to it from a point of, of having used them before. Okay, so in summary, this is a lot of information, we know. Uh, it's a lot to navigate, especially if you are new to wanting to explore these, these types of tools to help your organization, so um, that's okay. Uh, here's what we want you, here are our big takeaways, here's what we want you to know today. An all-in-one gives you the most bang for your buck. It covers a lot of functionality under one license fee. So what we talked about here today, that would be Microsoft Office 365 or G Suite. Um, All-in-ones also provide those admin controls over user accounts, which is important for sustainability and continuity in your organization. Uh, if you have volunteers, it gives you a little bit of a, a level of control over uh, what they're using, their, their communication, their email. It also gives it a more professional polish because it's coming all from your organization um, as opposed to someone's personal cell phone or, or email account, things like that. Um, it also, if someone leaves your organization, uh, you still have the rights and the ownership of, of their documents and their communications. So that's important. And then finally, many third-party apps integrate with Microsoft and Google, so you're not cutting anyone off who's been using other tools necessarily if you, if you move into Microsoft or Google. On the other hand, the standalones, so with third-party apps, they may offer more bells and whistles. They are focused on doing one thing well. Project management is a great example of that. Those tools are for project management, and they're not trying to focus on doing anything else and so there's just a lot more functionality there. Um, they, you can also implement one thing now versus trying to transition to a whole new, uh, a whole new system. So if you, what you're needing right now is a way to video conference, but you've got people on, um, some using Office, some using Google, some are volunteers, some are staff, but you really right now just need to be able to get people on a webinar or, or meeting virtually, then go to Zoom, go to go to meeting. Use those things um, because they're going to be faster to implement as opposed to trying to do that largely as an organization. And it may actually also be more cost effective for you to do one thing as opposed to take on a license for a whole group of things. So consider that. And finally, most of them integrate with Microsoft and Google anyway. So this is especially helpful if you have team members working across those two different platforms, different software, different hardware. Those third-party apps may provide more integration with Microsoft and Google than Microsoft and Google would provide uh, externally to those third-party apps. So with that, I know this was a lot. Uh, Matthew and I are gonna take a few questions in our last few minutes here. We'll, we'll go a little long. Um, so I'm gonna open it up. You can ask those questions in chat. Um, yes, the replay will be available. And let me, let me start my video too for some Q&A. Uh, yes, the replay will be available. GCN.org forward slash C19 webinars. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see a bunch of green boxes at the bottom. And those are all of our replays. This will be there by the end of the day. Um, and it will not only be the recording, it will be the slide deck and also some of the links that we've referenced, we will include there as well. Um, we host that, since we've been talking about it, I can tell you we host that on uh, OneDrive via SharePoint, which is Microsoft product. And I really like that it allows me to include URLs in my document storage. So I can, I can put up MP4 videos, I can put up a, a document to share, but I can also add a URL and it shows it in the list of items. So that's been really helpful to us. 
Any questions you guys have for us? I do want to make sure you know as well. Um, again, this is this has been a lot of information. We wanted to kind of give a big bucket overview. But if you have any specific things that you um, that you want to follow up with either Matthew or I on, the best way to reach out to us is info at gcn.org and go ahead and reference this webinar so you can say tech tools in the subject line. Um, our team is checking that, that account daily and forwarding things to who they go to. That's one of the ways that we are able to be efficient. Um, and so uh, we use Zendesk for that. We didn't talk about Zendesk today, but we do use Zendesk for that. That's another, another thing that's out there. If you feel like we need to do a follow-up or you have some specific questions, I hope you will reach out to us there. I don't see anything coming in on chat, so I will, I will um, move to our final statement which is this, um, everything right now, it is hard, it is a lot, and it is happening fast. Um, but you are not alone, GCN and our whole team of people are here with you, and if there's anything we can do to support your organization beyond what's provided on, on the site at GCN.org, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, that is what we are here for, it is the work that we love to do, is support you in the work that you do. So with that, stay well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye.